Okay, so welcome everyone to the very first Wikipedia tutorial that is collocated with the web conference. Uh, in the last uh, two years, we already organized, we organized several tutorials, but this is the first one that we uh, organized as part of the web conference. And it's, uh, it's our pleasure to be part of this uh, big event. Uh, my name is Milan Dojinovsky. I work for the INFI uh, institution, uh, which is, uh, co-hosted uh, at the Leipzig University. And with me here are also my colleagues, Jan Forberg and Johannes Frey, that will uh, give presentation on the following sessions around the technology around uh, DBpedia. So uh, the focus of this tutorial is to give some information about the DBpedia technology, which includes the DBpedia knowledge graph the Wikipedia uh, infrastructure, as well as we will give some information about how this uh, community project is organized. Um, so you will learn about the extraction process, the release process, as well as the formal organization of the Wikipedia community project, which is the, the formal entity that coordinates all these efforts are, is the Wikipedia Association. You will also learn about the infrastructure, which includes the database platform, which is the one of the latest advancements around DBpedia, as well as some uh, widely known services, which is the DBpedia Spotlight and the Lookup service. And last but not least, uh, my colleague Johannes will also uh, give you some information about the current motto of the DBpedia project, which is global and unified access to linked data via DBpedia. So this is uh, briefly the agenda. Uh, we have three sessions as part of this tutorial. After each session, we will give some room for questions. So if you have any questions, please pose the questions in the chat and we will be happy to take them from there. Uh, so the first will be a general introduction to the Wikipedia knowledge graph and the Wikipedia community. And the next session will be around the Wikipedia infrastructure. And the third session is dedicated to the topic of global and unified access to, to linked data. Yeah, as I said, feel free to post your question in the chat. We will be happy to take some of those questions. Uh, please mute yourself uh, for a better call hygiene. Uh, and of course, you will be able to retrieve and uh, follow and uh, check the slides afterwards. Uh, they are already published. You can find the link in the slides, which is tinyurl.com slash dbpedia. Okay, so let me uh, say a few words about the general mission of the DBpedia. So it all started back in 2007 as uh, an idea of some great enthusiasts, uh, some great people with some great ideas. And this idea was around what, uh, what if we could... Uh, query the knowledge that we have in Wikipedia the same way we query uh, a regular, a regular databases using SQL. So the idea was to develop a tool that will extract the knowledge from Wikipedia and export this knowledge into structured format, machine readable format, so that uh, humans can query this language and can submit uh, complex questions and get uh, complex answers as well. So the benefit at that time was that we could query Wikipedia as a database. Since 2007, uh, the project evolved and over the years, the mission a bit shaped. Uh, however, still the current, the original definition uh, holds which is a crowdsourced community effort to extract structured information from Wikipedia and make this information available on the web. This is still valid. However, in addition to this, we have the so-called uh, new mission, uh, global and unified access to knowledge or, or knowledge graphs. Um, this is a very, very intuitive uh, uh, mission and goal since uh, over the years, Wikipedia has been always the central point for integration. So uh, we, within the linked open data initiative, many uh, providers publish their data and link their data. Uh, that was one of the tasks. When you publish data, you're supposed to also link the data 
And since uh, DBpedia is a cross-domain knowledge uh, graph, many people find integration points into the uh, DBpedia knowledge graph. And everyone started linking and DBpedia became kind of the hub for all these different knowledge graphs. Um, and our current mission is also in this direction towards global and unified access to uh, knowledge graphs. As I mentioned, it all started in 2007 uh, when was when was the uh, the Lint Open Data Initiative uh, uh, announced. Uh, few data sets have been published and linked between each other. Uh, in 2007, also the first extraction framework has been developed. The first Sparkle endpoint has been uh, deployed, as well as the first linked data version of the DBpedia knowledge graph has been uh, has been uh, established as well. Uh, between 2007 and 2008 we have in 2009 we have uh, a lot of research around linking knowledge graphs linking linking data sets uh, and here DBpedia plays uh, a major role since uh, many of these uh, efforts uh, were towards linking, external knowledge bases with DBpedia. In 2010, um, uh, the DBpedia ontologies has been opened for, uh, for community edits. So anyone since 2010 can edit the ontology, which is the, the model that we use to, uh, to capture the information from Wikipedia. Uh, we already in 2011 see industry adoption. So IBM Watson has been using uh, DBpedia in the Jeopardy challenge where the, for the first time a machine won the challenge against a human. Then we have some, uh, some uh, adoption within uh, big uh, companies such as Yahoo, BBC, Siemens, Unicode also adopted some of the information that is extracted from Wikipedia. So we see that also be these big players around the world uh, recognize DBpedia as an important effort and, and, uh, and an asset. Between 2012 and 2016, for these four to five years, uh, there has been a lot of uh, effort put on uh, expanding, not from English only, to all the languages that are uh, within the Wikipedia namespace. Um, so, for the moment, uh, in this, uh, for this, uh, within this effort, the Wikipedia expanded to over uh, 130 uh, languages. Uh, we also included Wikidata extraction uh, and also uh, information from Wikipedia Commons. Uh, in over the years, different institutions, different research teams, they developed very relevant. Uh, technologies for the DBpedia. However, they, they were not in sync. Um, so in order to synchronize uh, these efforts, uh, in 2014 was established the DBpedia Association as a foundation for the DBpedia uh, knowledge graph. And this association basically coordinates all the efforts. As part of DBpedia came out some uh, standards and W3C specifications such as Shackle, which is a widely known specification for validation of, of, of data. Um, it was uh, basically uh, kind of uh, prototyped and, and developed uh, by one of our colleagues from the uh, team uh, at uh, Leipzig University. Uh, in 2018, uh, uh, and until 2020, the DBpedia knowledge graph has grown significantly. And currently, uh, there are over 20 billion of facts published every month. Um, it, is, uh, it is a huge data set that uh, requires some effort for the maintenance. Yeah, so uh, about the DBpedia community project and uh, its organizational structure. So it's basically organized or uh, drop down into the Wikipedia chapters. We have different type of chapters. We have language chapters, which are the most prominent chapters, focusing on extraction of information for a particular language, such as English, German, Dutch, Czech, Polish, Hungarian. There are over 20 languages, uh, 20 language chapters. 
Then we have regional chapters for, dedicated for cities or individual countries. And we have also domain chapters, which are focused on particular domains, such as law, medicine, media, and science, different domains. Um, as part of the Wikipedia Association, there are many uh, institutions uh, involved as uh, members. We have 30 plus Wikipedia members. Over 40% of these members come from the industry. Then we have uh, uh, about 35% of nonprofit organizations that uh, joined the Wikipedia Association, and about 20% of tiny self self employed uh, members, which have also joined. If anyone is interested in joining this uh, uh, and becoming a Wikipedia member, please follow the link that is on this slide, which is wikipedia.org slash members slash membership, and you can find more information there. Okay, so let's move to something more concrete, more technical. Uh, uh, let me give you an overview first about how the Wikipedia knowledge graph release process is, uh, is organized. So basically it involves uh, six uh, phases. Um, uh, we have the first phase. The first phase is where people come uh, and contribute with mappings and edits of the ontology. The mappings are basically mappings uh, uh, which uh, map information from Wikipedia info boxes to the, the Wikipedia ontology. So it's basically, uh, establishing links about what information should be represented with the what property or class into the WPD ontology. That's the fact, first phase, which is primarily manual phase, I would say. The second phase is the actual execution of the extraction process over, this, over the Wikipedia dumps and using the mappings that have been deployed or defined in the, the, in, in the first phase. This is the second uh, phase where we extract information using the extraction framework, which is a tool that uh, basically uh, uses the mappings and uh, extracts the knowledge. Then we have the third phase, which is the parsing and validation of the data against strict rules. Here we use various strategies, various approaches, uh, but primarily Shackle, which is the, the data validation standard that I uh, mentioned before. That's one of the technology that is, that is used to parse, validate, uh, and check the data if it is uh, according to our uh, um, uh, uh, according to our rules that we define. Uh, after the data is extracted, validated, then we publish the data. So we release these data artifacts. What is important to mention is that uh, the Wikipedia knowledge graph is not a single data set, but it, cons it consists of many small relatively small partitions that are released as data artifacts. So these data artifacts are published on the uh, dedicated uh, uh, platform, which is called the data bus platform. Uh, and then in the follow-up phase, which is the ID management and knowledge fusion phase, uh, these data artifacts are grabbed for different languages, fused together, and deployed again on the data bus as the final knowledge graph. So we can see that we start, this is basically the, the overarching uh, release process starting with the mappings, then we have extraction, then we have validation, then we have the actual release of these different data set partitions on the data bus. Then we have the fusion of the knowledge from different Wikipedia languages together and finally, deployment of this uh, resulting final knowledge graph on the data bus. More about the fifth phase, uh, we'll tell you my colleague uh, Johannes in the last uh, session of the tutorial. Uh, here is an overview of the infrastructure. So we have uh, in the middle, the, the middleware, so-called the Wikipedia data bus, uh, which is kind of a digital factory platform that uh, is used to, uh, which is used to host metadata for the, all the different artifacts that are being uh, generated o, 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 uh, throughout the process of, of uh, uh, extraction and publishing the, data, the, the Wikipedia knowledge graph. Then we have the information extraction framework, 
That's the core technology that we use here. Then we have DBpedia Live, which is a, a live version of, a, of the extraction framework, which as soon as new updates are occur in a particular Wikipedia article, the DBpedia Live uh, picks the, that article and extracts the most recent information. So it's very, very useful tool. And uh, we are also maintaining and uh, using this tool. And uh, down below, we can see the services that are basically exploiting this information that we generate with the DBpedia uh, uh, database platform, uh, DBpedia Knowledge Graph. Uh, that's the DBpedia Spotlight which is uh, a named entity recognition tool. We have DBpedia Lookup and DBpedia Archival, which is a tool that aims at uh, collecting and uh, uh, crawling uh, different ontologies uh, on the web. Here's just an illustration about what information we have in Wikipedia that's on the left side. So basically an info box uh, about uh, the proc in Czech Wikipedia. And on the right side, we have the let's say, link data representation of this information, uh, uh, again, for the same entity, which is Prague. Uh, throughout the process, there are many artifacts being generated. Um, uh, however, the core groups of artifacts are the mappings-based uh, artifacts, the generic artifacts, the text artifacts, the Wikidata artifacts, as well as the fusion and global IDs. So let me go over each of these artifacts and give you some information about what information and how this works. So the mappings based extraction and all the artifacts that are a result of this extraction process uh, are a result of applying the mappings over the XML dumps. So here is an example of such mapping that you can see. On the left side is what you see in Wikipedia or if you want to edit the page, this is the syntax that is being used in Wikipedia. So you can see that they have a special wiki syntax and that in the uh, bottom part, you see this info box uh, part, which is basically uh, the info box description. And there are some properties there. There is the name, official name, native name, native name length, settlement type. And what we have here is basically uh, what we have here is basically a mapping which maps information from uh, the info box to a property in our uh, in our uh, ontology. So what we can see here is uh, let's say here is template property settlement time settlement type, which checks if there if this contains a particular value city. Here is another example where we, we have a settlement type template property which checks checks for uh, uh, checks if the in the info info box we have uh, uh, a value called metropolis and if this is the case then we map this information to a concept called city. Here is another example where particular values such as the yeah the, those that are indicated here in the slide are mapped to uh, uh, ontology properties, which is area total, as well as we map to a particular unit or uh, data type. And here is the urban uh, area urban, which is also mapped to a data type square kilometers. So basically from the mappings that we have here on the left side, we get two triples that are on the right side. So by applying these mappings, we, we get two triples. That's the mappings uh, extraction. Then we have the generic extraction, which is an automatic extraction. Uh, it aims at coverage. So it aims at uh, extraction of unmapped information in info boxes, as well as extraction of other structured information found, found in the Wikipedia pages. Uh, this means that information such as categories, labels, um, interlanguage links, this type of information is extracted and published using the generic extraction. Here is an example of the generic extraction where the property name for Prague or native name Praha is mapped to the Wikipedia triples 
uh, within the namesace of dbpedia property dbp so here we have dbp name proc and dbp native name proc uh, praha uh, another so we discussed so far mapix extraction generic extraction the next very important is the text extraction that's uh, uh, also very important uh, uh, artifact group which aims at extraction of the content from every Wikipedia article. What does it mean? So by, by applying the text extraction, we extract the contents of each Wikipedia article, which are the texts plus its structure and links. So within this uh, artifact or, or data set, you have the text, you have the sections, subsections, subsections, so all the structure of the Wikipedia article, as well as, as, well as the uh, paragraphs and the links within the text. Um, so I highly recommend that if you are doing some NLP stuff that you look at this particular uh, data set, which is very, very interesting. We also apply Wikidata extraction. So basically we map the Wikidata to, um, we, to uh, the Wikipedia ontology. And by doing this, we have then unified view across, uh, unified view over uh, Wikipedia information and Wikidata information. So basically it allows us to combine uh, information from Wikipedia as well as Wikidata, which is very, very interesting. Uh, several times I mentioned that the Wikipedia ontology, that's kind of the heart of Wikipedia. Uh, uh, hum, uh, people can uh, jump in and edit the ontology. Currently, it contains over 700 classes and more than 3,000 properties. Um, and it's also available um, on the data bus. So you can find the DBP ontology on this link. Uh, the ontology is edited on the mapping server. Here is, here is just an illustration. On the left side, you can see the editing page for the ontology class person. On the right side, you can see uh, the, the viewer for this, for this ontology where you can browse the ontology and also apply some edits if you, if you need. Over the years, uh, uh, DBpedia of course had some impact. Uh, the most impact has been in research where over 35,000 of articles uh, are mentioning using developing uh, technology using DBpedia. So it's very, that's very, very important. Then, as I mentioned, it has been used uh, also by I, IBM Watson in the, deep, uh, in the Jeopardy challenge where for first time a uh, machine won the challenge against a human. Uh, Unicode has used uh, DBpedia. Uh, DivBot uh, is using DBpedia. Uh, so there are many, uh, let's say, uh, the impact is, is huge. Uh, uh, the Wikipedia knowledge graph is also published uh, under the public endpoints. So there are three core Sparkle endpoints. The, the first is the one that we that most people know about. That's the wikipedia.org slash Sparkle. This is where you find the, the latest release of the Wikipedia knowledge graph. Then we have a data bus Sparkle endpoint, which hosts and publish information for all the data sets that are published uh, on the data bus. And then we have also the Wikipedia live endpoint, which serves a live extracted data. Uh, I have some examples here, which can, which illustrates uh, the power of the Wikipedia knowledge graph. So here is the first example, which uh, is rather simple example, which allows you, uh, we, and here is a query, which uh, uh, will retrieve all the persons, their names in English, the, their birth country and the country population. So this is a Sparkle query that we can submit. And uh, yeah, and here are the results. So basically we get a link for each person, its name in English, the country of birth and the population. Uh, Another more complex query that uh, usually you cannot uh, ask, uh, let's say Google for such an answer. Uh, so uh, what if you would like to retrieve all soccer players that are born in a country with more than 10 million inhabitants played as a goalkeeper for a club that has a stadium with more than 30,000 of seats. So 
a very complex query, which is very difficult to get an answer on. However, with DBpedia, you can uh, get an answer. And this is how this query looks like. Here's a better uh, visualization. So basically we retrieve uh, the links of all the persons, we retrieve their name, the country of birth, the population of the country where they have been born, uh, the team that they plat played, uh, and the, uh, we filled, uh, we, we constrained only for persons that played in a position as a goalkeeper. We retrieve the stadium of the team and the seating capacity, and then we apply some filters for the language, for the stadium, stadium capacity, that is, it must be over 30,000 and population over 1 million. And if we apply this query, we get uh, these uh, results here. For basically, some people that played as a goalkeeper for uh, for uh, yeah for a team that has a stadium with a capacity over thirty thousand uh, seats. Okay, so with this, I would conclude my part, uh, which is basically this first session and the, the introduction session. Uh, and I would be happy to take some questions if there are any. Uh, I don't know exactly how to go back to the to the chat. Okay, here is this. Okay, uh, I guess there are no questions for the moment. So feel free to post your questions. We will be, we will be happy to take your questions even at the end of the tutorial. So uh, feel free to to ask. So since there are no questions, we can directly continue with the second session, which is on the Wikipedia infrastructure, and it will be given by my colleague Jan uh, Forberg. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Milan. Hello, my name is Jan Forberg. I also work for the Institute of Applied Informatics um, at Leipzig, and I will take you through the second session, the Wikipedia infrastructure. The DBpedia infrastructure highly relies on uh, the data bus technology stack, which you can see below. And this is a range of applications and services that are based on the DBpedia data bus. And this allows you to easily deploy your own infrastructure with your own data. But this is also technology that we use to manage the life cycle of the DBpedia data and to publish the DBpedia data and then uh, make it available in all the services of uh, uh, that you know, maybe the, the, the public Sparkle endpoint, the lookup service, the spotlight service, and so on. Uh, first of all, let's have a look at the bottom part of the stack, which is the data bus. And it has briefly been mentioned before, but in more detail, the DBpedia data bus is an RDF based metadata registry. And therefore, it holds a lot of metadata about files in general. The properties of these metadata uh, that are contained in this metadata are, for example, the format of the files, uh, how they are compressed, the size of the files, then in order to validate files that you have locally against something um, on a server, we have the checksums. To download the files, you will need download URLs. And then there might be more information in that metadata describing, for example, uh, languages. There might be in a data set multiple files, one is in English, one is in German, one is in French, and then there is metadata uh, reflecting that difference. Data retrieval on the data bus, since it's an RDF based metadata registry, can be done via Sparkle queries, same as you would query uh, the public DBpedia endpoint as Milan has shown. The same power, the same complex queries can be now uh, also sent against the metadata to make a really faceted, uh, 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 yeah, really tailored to your use case uh, selection of data. Another uh, big benefit of using Sparkle as this interface for your for your data retrieval is that Sparkle cannot be only sent against one Sparkle endpoint, but it can be sent against multiple Sparkle endpoints at the same time. So you could, for example, query multiple databases and aggregate data across data bus instances. The DBpedia data bus has a high focus on automatization, interoperability, and extensibility. All the commands, all the, the actions that um, you can do with the data bus are accessible via, via an API, so you can automate, uh, automate all the processes. 
It's highly interoperable since the main interface for interacting with the DBPD data bus, at least on the retrieval side, is Sparkle, which is very flexible. And it's also very extensible. There's an entire framework. framework uh, I can show you here on the previous slides here on the right side, uh, the mods. This is an entire framework that we won't cover today, but um, you can uh, read up uh, on um, to modify and extend metadata. Databus is inspired by Maven. So Maven also, I think, has these groups and artifacts for software where you can declare data, uh, excuse me, software dependencies and in your document state that your software needs other software in a very specific version. And that same concept is ported to the data world. So you can now declare using the Databus data dependencies and retrieve specific files or specific data sets in a specific version. Same as Maven, Databus uses so-called artifacts. So an artifact is a logical data entity. And this data entity might contain uh, tens, hundreds of different files that still logically are related to the same data entity. So for example, uh, the logical DBpedia data set all Wikipedia page titles would consist of multiple files, different languages, different formats, different versions over time, but they still belong to the same artifact. Artifacts can then be grouped into groups to uh, give them some sort of logical connection. Each artifact has a clean, unique identifier, and that's important so you can retrieve sub uh, subsequent versions of this artifact under the same identifier on the data bus. So you'd always retrieve the Wikipedia page titles under the same identifier and would be able to always fetch the latest version of that artifact. You can see how the data bus identifiers are organized. The identifier structure starts, of course, with the base URL of the data bus instance, followed by the user then the group as a path segment, the artifact identifier as a path segment, and the last path segment is then the version. So you could cut off each path segment to get the user identifier, a group identifier, an artifact identifier, and a version identifier. And since this is all in the metadata, this enables queries such as give me all the versions of a group or give me all the latest versions um, or give me the latest version of an artifact. Even queries like give me the latest version of all the artifacts in a specific group and so on. Let's have a look at the second part of the technology stack, which is the data bus collections. Data bus collections is the core aggregation and retrieval mechanism of the data bus. And it is basically an abstraction layer for Sparkle. Sparkle is the main uh, interface language and data bus collections wrap that and uh, provide a more readable and understandable interface for interacting with the data bus. It can be understood as sort of a shopping cart for data. So you can browse your data bus instance or uh, someone else's data bus instance. On each page, uh, you have an icon to <clears throat> add uh, this artifact or group to your collection. Then there's an HTML editor provided uh, with a web, web interface where you can go and uh, apply additional filters and add more groups and artifacts and then publish your collection. So others can use this uh, shopping cart as well. The core properties of a collection are its uh, resource identifier, the URI, uh, so you can share it with others and always access it under the same identifier, specifies a title abstract, and of course, its content. And the content is either a Sparkle query. Um, so this, this also works. But most of the time, it would be a JSON structure that is translatable into a Sparkle query. So you will be editing a JSON structure in your, in your HTML editor. And then this will be put into uh, or translated into a Sparkle query for uh, the Sparkle endpoint of the data bus. Here uh, you can see uh, an image. This is an example collection where you can, uh, uh, this of the of the collection editor. If there is time at the end, I will also show 
um, this uh, editor in action. Here you can see uh, this example collection targeting multiple data buses. So the, there's one data bus deployed at my local host, and there's the development data bus for DBpedia. And each data bus, uh, then on each data bus, I have made a selection for specific files. So for, uh, in, on the local host, I selected some prefusion data set in a very specific version. And on the dev data bus, I selected the latest version and with some additional filter on Wikidata, Wikidata labels. And here you can see the Sparkle query that is generated from this structure. So again, here you can see we have a top part and a bottom part of our of our selection tree. And this is sort of reflected here in this bucket query. You have this uh, here in the top where at line 16, you can see we, we select a, an artifact in a very specific version. And on line 35, you can see some sub query that selects the latest version of an artifact. And yeah, this is automatically generated from this JSON structure. The DBpedia data bus is only a DBpedia uh, a data bus instance dedicated to the DBpedia data. So there's a data bus available at databus.dbpedia.org, but it is also encouraged to deploy your own data bus instance for your projects or working groups, since the metadata that is published can be easily merged with, for example, the DBpedia data bus. The basic structure reflects the extraction methods that Milan presented. Uh, so we have this generic extraction, the mappings extraction, and so on. And the groups of the data bus, uh, groups again are a um, uh, grouping layer for artifacts. And they are labeled after the extraction methods. So for example, we have the generic group and the mappings group. And the extractions results are split into multiple artifacts as also mentioned before. So for example, the Wikipedia labels, the Wikipedia abstracts, and the infobox properties. And so you could find uh, the same artifacts in both groups. If you find the Wikipedia labels in the generic group, that means those are the generically extracted Wikipedia labels. The Wikipedia labels artifact in the mappings group would then be the mapping-based extracted Wikipedia labels. Here's a list of, or some examples of prominent DBpedia knowledge graph artifacts. So there's the labels, geo coordinates, instance types, mapping based objects. You can find the DBpedia ontology on the data bus, same as links and the global IDs. The labels, as already mentioned, are a good choice if you want to do any NLP processing. You can find it on a dbpedia slash generic slash labels on the dbpedia data bus. You can make a distinguish, uh, make, make, can distinguish between files based on the language. So you can select English labels, German labels, French labels, and so on in over 130 languages. And for any NLP task or label-based indexing, uh, semantic dictionary task, this would be the artifact that you're looking for. The instance types artifact also quite useful if you want to do anything related to types, uh, any filtering uh, basically on, on, on instance types. You can distinguish here between specific and transitive uh, content variants. So there's files only containing the most specific type of an instance. And there's also um, a file containing all the types um, in, the, in the hierarchy of the DBpedia uh, ontology. Then another artifact that could be useful to you is the geo coordinates artifact retrievable at dbpedia slash generic slash geo coordinates. And those contain the longitude and latitude um, of all the dbpedia instances that um, are have some geospatial information. And this is, of course, useful for neighborhood based retrieval and yeah, spatial query, geospatial queries. All right, so uh, that much about the DBpedia data bus and collections. Now let's have a look at how you would go uh, and deploy these services yourself. Each of these boxes here in the DBpedia technology stack 
um, can be deployed using Docker. So there's a Docker container for the data bus, there's a Docker container for the on-demand spatula store, for the lookup search, for the spotlight, and so on. Deploying that is quite simple. For each um, container, we have a slide here with a link to the respective repository. There's a, usually a very short uh, list of bash commands that you can execute in order to uh, start the service on your own infrastructure. And those are the same services that we use uh, for the DBpedia knowledge graph. So the, the data bus is the same that, that we use to publish all the DBpedia artifacts and do the fusion. And the uh, Sparkle endpoint quick starter is the same that we use for the public DBpedia endpoint. So here you can see the list of bash commands, for example, for the on-demand Sparkle store. And there you uh, would go ahead and clone the repository specify a collection that you want to use into your Sparkle store and uh, specify some password and then just run Docker Compose up. So a very, very simple uh, set of commands to create a Sparkle store with RDF data of your choice. The on-demand lookup works similarly, excuse me. Um, there's also an extensive documentation on um, the GitHub repository linked here. Lookup is a service for um, and creating an inverse index to search, uh, have a fuzzy search on labels to retrieve DBpedia entities. And in order to create this inverse index, you load RDF data uh, into a on-disk graph database and then select key value pairs using Sparkle. And these key value pairs are then used to create the reverse index. Also, this is deployable uh, with uh, selecting data from the data bus, loading it into your uh, lookup instance container and starting up the container. DBpedia Spotlight works similarly. There is pre-trained DBpedia Spotlight models available on the data, uh, data bus. And uh, when starting your DBpedia Spotlight Docker container, you specify the artifact that uh, contains this Spotlight model. And um, yeah, just wait for the Docker container to start. Basically. If you want to cr uh, create Dockerized data bus applications yourself, this is the workflow that we usually use when uh, developing these um, uh, data bus enabled applications. We use Docker Compose to start up multiple Docker containers. Then we have a download container that is concerned with pulling data from the, or like retrieving download links from a data bus and then downloading the files. Then we have several helper containers. So for example, for the Sparkle uh, on demand store, we have a virtuoso container that is being started up and then we have a third Docker container. This is the application container that waits for the download of the data until all the data is available locally. And then it does something with the helper containers. So for example, it um, starts uh, or runs the commands to load the downloaded data into the Sparkle store. So if you're interested in developing your own data bus applications, this would be one easy way to, to realize that. All right, um, are there any questions so far? Let's have a look at the chat. Did I drop from the meeting? No. Oh, you're here. Uh, I'm there's here. A question, yeah. There is a question about uh, regarding the registration. Um, can you post it to me on Slack? I, my interface sort of. Ah, no, here, here it is, sorry. Uh, it's yeah. here in the top. Is there some chat? Perfect.
right. Um, how about the registration? Um, there might be some issues with the databus.dbpedia.org. Um, also, this whole concept of um, having this having the data bus, the Wikipedia data bus as a centralized platform for all metadata somewhat changed to um, a concept of um, only having selected data sets, mainly the Wikipedia data sets on the Wikipedia data bus, and then having people run their own data bus instances uh, to publish their own data. I will um, also um, show you an example how this is still useful uh, even if you don't have any data on your um, own local data bus at all. Um, if you're interested in checking out the features of the data bus without deploying your own instance, please try the dev data bus. This is available. I will post this in the chat at HTTPS dev data bus .org. So here is a more recent version of the data bus. The dbpedia data bus still runs on an older version. And the more recent features can be tested here. If you press login, you should be able to log in with your GitHub or Google account. All right, since I still uh, um, have time, I will uh, show you an example of creating a collection. So I have uh, now um, a local data bus running here. Uh, I used the uh, Docker uh, container uh, from the uh, GitHub repository of the data bus. This should be linked in the slides. And uh, started up the container with its default configuration. And uh, this is what I got uh, when I go to localhost 3000. I have my data bus instance so far with no data here at all. Also, there is the instance on the dev server, the dev databus.dbpedia.org uh, data bus instance. So this is another data bus instance. And as you can see, there's already stuff going on here. I already published quite some uh, data artifacts on this data bus. I can go here and, and search for, for uh, things on the, on the data bus. And uh, what I'm going to do is create a, a collection on my own local data bus that targets uh, artifacts on this dev data bus. So I copy this to my clipboard, this URL, and I go to my own local data bus and go to the collection editor by clicking on my icon here and clicking the collections button. And here you can see I have an overview of all the collections that I have created thus far. And I will delete this uh, example collection and create a fresh one and navigate into the editor by clicking it. Description is not so interesting right now, but here you can see the hierarchy of the collection. So there is the root node is my collection itself and this first node that is added automatically is this data bus. Since I don't have any data on my data bus yet, this is not very useful, so I'm going to remove this node. What is, however, useful is the dev data bus. So I will post this URL here and add the dev data bus to my tree. And now I can go ahead and search for some artifact here on this dev data bus. Um, sure, why not? Let's go for prefusion. And here you can see there's uh, three data, uh, three files selected that are contained in this group. And I don't even ha uh, have any data published on my data bus here and can still make a selection on data on another data bus. I can, of course, um, add my own data bus again. This should work. And then once I have artifacts published to my own data bus, add them here. Here you can see, oops, let's move this real quick. Here you can see the generated Sparkle query and this service keyword here in the query specifies that I am not targeting my own Sparkle endpoint of my local data bus, but I'm targeting the Sparkle endpoint of the dev 
data bus. Additionally, I can click on nodes here in the collection editor and select facets. So for example, uh, let's go for the format. And let's say I'm only interested in TSV files at the filter. And now the selection that I have is only the, the TSV file from the files contained in the prefusion group. All right, are there any questions concerning this collection editor or any other questions on my session? If not, then I will give the floor to Johannes Frey for the third session. Okay, then Johannes, the floor is yours. Thanks everyone. Johannes? Johannes, are you here? Yes. Ah, great. I'm sharing my screen. Just had a quick hiccup. Can you see my screen? Yep. Already. All right. And this is your USA pack list for next week. <laughs> okay. And I'm sharing the right, the wrong screen. Um, is it now visible? <clears throat> Yeah, working. Okay, perfect. Yeah, my name is Johannes Frey. I'm also a researcher uh, at Leipzig University and uh, also a member of the DBPTR lab. And today I would like to present uh, the third session towards global and unified access to linked data. As Milan already um, tried to um, explain in the first part, there's this new mis mission, Global and Unified Access to Knowledge Graphs. And as a yeah, substantial part of it, we consider Global and Unified Access to Linked Data. Um, so wh when, we, when we used the word global, we borrowed this term from the um, database terminology from the 80s. Um, global as few and local as few. So we mean that uh, we want to have a central access point that has knowledge over decentralized linked data sources. And this access needs to be unified as well. That means we want to reduce the technical and semantic heterogeneity and also variability of these sources. And in the yeah, recent years, um, we've developed some technologies, especially the global ID and property management, which I um, will um, explain uh, in more detail. And I will also show you in the part after um, how you can use these um, ID management services in order to make a global and unified Sparkle queries with a short demo. And if there's still time left, then I will also quickly um, um, explain the Wikipedia archivo. So let's just start right away with the global identity management. Uh, I, I don't know how, how familiar you were with the concept of linked data, but um, in, its, in its nature, it is designed to be decentralized. So um, data sets uh, issue their own identifiers and then can link with so-called all same as links to other entities which are located on other services and other authorities or publishers. And uh, due to this nature, people can um, 
describe or express data about the same thing, but using different entity identifiers or different um, properties, so vocabulary um, terms for for characteristics like a birth date of a person or something like this. And um, yeah, this leads to redundancy for these identifiers for the same things or same properties. And moreover, there's also a lot of change ongoing. So there can be instabilities of these identifiers due to a link route because a server um, is, is um, not available anymore after some years or due to technical failure and so on. And this leads to, to um, yeah, a couple of problems when you want to combine these different RDF data sets into one knowledge graph. And you basically need to, to gain a kind of global knowledge and also unified be unique identifiers. So how does it work, the identity management? It's based on a actually rather simple idea. We, uh, we pre-compute uh, clusters or more specifically um, connected components and then assign global, so-called global identifiers on these clusters. And the clusters are derived on links we harvest from the web or a set of files from the data bus. So uh, one example cluster can be seen on the right. You can see the individual sources, they, uh, they don't really know about each other. So they usually link to one other source, but C, for example, has no knowledge of the source A or the source B, but it has knowledge of the source D, but D does not have knowledge about uh, the source C, for example. And the idea is to, to calculate these components and then assign an identifier for uh, this component. In the case of these entities, we would assign a global um, ID. And in case of uh, properties, we would assign a so-called global property and then uh, issue uh, identifiers for it. So how, um, yeah, these, these uh, computation is performed in cycles. So we, after, after time slices, we update these linking states because this, is, this data is always, um, yeah, is, um, needs to be updated and the link stages can change. So first of all, when we perform um, a new cycle, we harvest the current links and identifiers of these of these different things from input files on the data bus. And then we assign new identifiers, which we call singleton identifiers. These um, form stable identifiers to every identifier which already exists, but in a unified way. And therefore, mathematically speaking, we um, yeah, we uh, do a bijection between these um, identif identifiers of the sources and our own identifiers. Then we can compute these uh, connecting components that I already highlighted. So we do this on the one hand for all these all same S links, but on the other hand also for the all equivalent property links. And then we uh, assign one global identifier for every cluster based on the cluster member with the lowest singleton ID. So let's assume the example again. You can see we have F, A, B, C, D, and E. And in lexical order, A has the lowest number um, in, the, in the cluster. And therefore, this is used as representant and global ID um, of this cluster. And once we have uh, performed these, these snapshots, we update a set of uh, microservices, which I will now explain more in detail. And uh, once um, the, the, the links change later, um, we can perform another cycle. And we, st as, as input, we use the previous cycle in order to keep these uh, singleton IDs stable, but also um, then um, recompute these connected components based on the new links. So that you, that this was a very theoretical that you can get, get now um, yeah, more plastic 
um, impression of this, um, I would like to dive into the uh, separate services and show how you can use it. And one major service is the so-called ID resolution service. So this allows you to um, um, return all the cluster members for a global ID in JSON format. You can see it on the right. So uh, there's one global ID, and then I see all the different identifiers for these um, for these uh, cluster. So there's Wikidata, for example, and then there's a different DBpedia version. Um, moreover, it allows to translate external IDs. So I can also use this IDs in order to get the global cluster. And um, it allows us uh, also to redirect old global IDs from a previous uh, cycle to the new one. And yeah, this can be used on your side also, even if you don't want to use the global IDs itself, you can use them to discover all other known uh, references for the same thing or the same property. Yeah, and we, we publicly host uh, both services for the global IDs and the global properties. I uh, can quickly show this, how this looks like. So, so this is the same example again. And um, in this example, I queried for the global ID, but instead I can also like query any, any identifier and it will redirect me to exactly the same page, which again tells me all the local identifiers and also their singleton identifiers. We also have a similar service or basically the same service for properties. Just have a look, a quick example here also. So there's this global property which encodes different um, child relations. So we have in DBpedia ontology, we have simple uh, ch child property and the German National Library, for example, uses the term has child and Wikidata uses uh, their own identifiers, which are usually starting with P for properties, and P40 is also this, this child um, relationship. Let's uh, jump over to the next um, microservice, which is also quite important. Um, Milan mentioned the pre-fusion and the fusion, so I, I don't want to go into detail. But uh, this, this browser allows us to show aggregated entity data based on this pre-fusion, but it already uses these unified IDs. So the global, identity, uh, global IDs and the global properties. And thus allows us to basically have an aggregated view on the data which is available uh, on, on, a, on a set of integrated public sources. So of course we cannot integrate all the sources which are available, um, but uh, in, this, in this current state, we have, for example, all the Wikipedia versions, Wikidata, uh, German National Library, Dutch National Library, GeoNames, uh, Music Brains, and some others. And yeah, this, this browser, as it says, it allows us to navigate between different clusters while uh, showing the different values, but it also has the provenance. So it sh shows us from which source actually which statement or which fact is coming from. I would also like to show this in a more practical example. So this is um, uh, one example entity, uh, Neskio, which is a Dutch, um, Dutch um, author or writer. Um, and uh, here we can, for example, see the birthplace. And we see that for Amsterdam, we have uh, two sources. We have um, the Dutch DBpedia, but also Wikidata, which tell us that he is born in Amsterdam. And for the um, Dutch National Library, it also says Amsterdam, but we can see it's, this is a text value only. So the library didn't perform any entity linking. But uh, here we can see it, it, this is hyperlinked because this is, if you, if you see it on the button, this is a global ID and we just browse um, and display the label of this global ID here. So once I click this global ID, 
I get the same view again, but now I can uh, browse this information for the city of Amsterdam and I can now, for example, inspect the information of the population numbers. And we can see that there is quite a variety of uh, population numbers uh, in the different sources. Let's go back to the um, NESCIO example. So the basic navigation you saw between clusters and of course I can um, filter for the properties in here. Um, as a, as a side note, this here is, this is actually selecting global properties, but we, uh, for, for better human readability, we uh, choose for every global property cluster, we use a property which is typically well known. So, uh, for example, DBpedia or the friend of a friend ontology, that's a simple rule set we have um, just in place to make this more better readable and more economic. And here you can also see, for example, um, the death date values of um, of this author. And you see that there's um, information from the Dutch, uh, from the German National Library. And uh, as I told you, there's provenance. So we can actually uh, click on the links and then we see the live data um, of, these, of these sources. Or we could also like uh, fetch the files uh, where we found this information from. So these files are um, persisted on the data bus. And uh, as you can see also, um, there is uh, a mismatch here. So this is actually not the death date, it's a death year. So there is a mapping issue, but you can also see that this is, and this is the same. And um, I will like to, would like to explain this in more detail in the next slide. So what we can do is, um, this was a, a human friendly visualization, but we can also ha have an API for, for this information and can uh, retrieve um, all the information um, with JSON. So I can quickly um, search for death date here and then um, it shows me the different death dates. Since this is a quite a messy, a few are not supposed to be read by humans. I prepared an excerpt here for better readability. So um, this, this JSON structure tells us here the global ID and then the global property. Remember, we, we use amenomic uh, representants to make it better readable here. And then you can see we have these two values which actually look the same, but in fact, they have a different type. So this source actually, which is uh, this Dutch National Library, you see the .nl, uses um, a string and the actual supposed value is to be of type date, which is um, correctly represented in the German National Library and in the uh, Dutch DBpedia. Uh, all the services we have shown before use some uh, technology which is mainly based on JSON. So they're not RDF native, but very efficient. But we also have, of course, RDF um, yeah, kind of proxies uh, in front of it. And a very simple one is the so-called RDF cluster link view, which shows us a star-shaped OS, same, uh, all same S links of this source. So star shape means the star is the global ID. So it is in the center and all, all um, other external links are um, then directly linked to the center. So you can see the example again, which I sh showed before about fair data. Yeah, and um, now I would like to show you how you can use this set of microservices or more specifically, especially this last one um, to use uh, in uh, Sparkle queries. So I've prepared here a very simple Sparkle query, which tries to query all global IDs for a set of entities in my knowledge graph. So what does it do? Um, I select, let's assume you have a knowledge graph and you, you just query on it a set of instances you're interested in. So in my case, I am I have uh, loaded a very tiny subset of the BPTL locations and I query for these. 
And then I used this microservice of globaldbpedia.org and um, pass my local identifier, which is called local. And then it helps me to retrieve um, these global IDs we have seen before, all the other global IDs. And then I can make use of the star shape to load all external IDs. So this is uh, how, how it looks like. So for example, here we have a huge, um, or a city which has a lot of outgoing links. Uh, you can see, uh, for, so this is the global ID for it. And uh, this is my local identifier. And then you can see we have uh, other identifiers. So this, for example, is the Spanish DBpedia, but we also have a GeoNames link, or we also have a link to Wikidata. And so I, 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 didn't, I didn't have this data somewhere in my Sparkle store. I just uh, queried this live from this microservice. I can also do the same or something very similar with the properties. So uh, I also prepared a, a very simple query here, which um, queries for all the properties or basically this, my local schema for my class of interest. So remember I, I queried for locations and now I basically select all properties which exist. And then I use a similar line of uh, Sparkle query or a statement which I used before, but this time I, I pass as value these different properties and it helps me to translate these properties into the external ones. So let's have a look here, for example, at thumbnail. Thumbnail is my, that's the term of my local schema. This is the global property uh, I have derived. And now it tells me what, for example, the Wikidata property is. So it's P18 and you see that is image. Okay, this sounds plausible. And for the German National Library, we can uh, even see the semantics or guess the semantics from the IRI itself. So it's depiction, this also seems right. So this helps me to translate my identifiers into external ones. And if I put these both pieces together, I can basically now query data and compare it. So query my data and compare it to other data without needing to know how this other data is actually structured. So this is uh, now a query which tries to evaluate um, my uh, population total numbers, for example, from my city. So what I do here is I just um, query for 100 locations and uh, their population number. Then I do uh, fill in the, the two snippets I've used before to get the global IDs and the global properties. And then I say, okay, I'm specifically interested in the Wikidata numbers. And then I fetch this number. And as you can see here, I, I don't use any knowledge about the schema in Wikidata or the identifiers in Wikidata besides saying, okay, it has to be of this type because but I use my local information, which is population total. And then the result of the query here basically shows me my local identifiers. Then I have the external identifiers, which are Wikidata, and I have my population value and uh, the remote population value. And if it's one, for example, you see that it's the same. And if it's significantly lower, then there's a huge disparity between that, it's like 273 and 818. And if, if it's significantly higher, then there's also a huge um, discrepancy. If we, if we, if, so this was, um, this was uh, an example on on a literal values, right? So numbers in this case, which are in, in RDF already normalized. So this works out of the box, but uh, let's remember this Nesquio example and uh, this Amsterdam example, for example. Um, so what I prepared here is a query, which um, tries to fetch information about 
this uh, Dutch writer, which is called Neskio. And then it um, queries for death place, birthplace, and occupation. And I also combine this again with these two snippets to uh, resolve these global identifiers and global properties. And also do something more, I uh, resolve um, global identifiers for the objects, right? So um, an occupation or a place that, that, sh that should not be a liter literal value, this should be a thing. So what we can see here is the result now, all information we get from the other sources is um, we get information from the Czech DBpedia about occupation and the birthplace, and we get information uh, from Wikidata about um, occupation, I think, no, this is place of birth, for example, and one of the other is occupation and death place. And then we have identifiers also here. These are Wikidata and um, 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 Czech DBpedia identifiers. And the problem is now here that we actually have the same information in a redundant way. So what I can do here is I just show you how these global um, IDs and properties can be used to unify it and normalize the data. Instead of querying for the external ID and external property, I now use the global ID and the global property. And as a result, I only get three values because they're, they're redundant, right? So this is, um, this is the global property for occupation. And this is the global ID for author and writer. So I can basically now um, normalize the value and get um, the information in a unified way out of it. Yeah, this is um, the, f the first major part. There is a lot of future work, which is supposed to, um, uh, which we can do. So first of all, um, the question is how can we scale this over a lot of sources? And the, th the idea here is to have a DNS-like uh, hierarchical um, delegation so that you have domains and, and geographic regions which take care of these microservices and then you get di redirected to the ones who are um, su supposed to um, uh, answer your request. And we would also like to serve actually a subset of fused data for these global identifiers so that this can be deal as yellow pages for linked data uh, in the future. Um, this, this information I have queried in the last, um, in the last slides um, was live, so it was dynamic. So I fetched these data dynamically from the other sources which also has, um, which is good, but it also has a problem if the sources are not available. So therefore I would like to quickly mention that um, we also have this concept of knowledge cartridges, which uh, are very similar. So we use this unified and global information with this global IDs and global properties and um, materialize um, views of these linked data sources and, and yeah, per system on the data bus. And therefore these, these cartridges can deal as kind of pre-compiled building blocks, which we can use for a very flexible and scalable creation of um, custom knowledge graphs. And uh, these, these knowledge graphs, um, uh, these cartridges, sorry, use the same JSON format I had quickly shown you in the GFS browser. Yeah, this is um, the, the major part I wanted to show. Um, Milan, are there already questions um, in, the, in the chat? Because I could, I think I'm technically, I've, I'm at the end of my session, but I still have some slides about the DBpedia archival. I, would, I can show, but if there are more questions, we could also use the time for questions. For the moment, there are no questions, but so I think you can just go ahead with archival as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, DBPITR Archivo um, is uh, a tool we also wrote um, one and a half years back and which now contains over 1,700 ontologies. And the idea here is that we have global and unified access to the web of ontologies. So a crucial part of linked data is these, is, is these ontologies. And um, especially when it comes to reliability of or, or yeah, sustainability of data, um, it's important that you know which version uh, of an ontology uh, you, you fetched and um, that it's still available um, after a period of time. So what we do here is we have a completely automated service which um, discovers and crawls on a large scale all the ontologies which it can find and then uses a persistent and unified snapshot um, versioning strategy in order to make these ontologies available. And uh, in the bottom below, you see there's a very simple API call, um, which is unified for every ontology where you can just provide the ontology identifier and then specify your format and your version. If you omit the version, you get the latest one um, to fetch this data. And Archivo is also, it's a, it's a publisher on the data bus. So it's, it's, it's an agent, we call it an agent. So it's a, a program which publishes data automatically on the data bus. And uh, using this, it is, it's possible uh, to ship data sets and apps with the most recent or a very specific version of ontologies using these collections. Um, um, Jan already mentioned. So in this example here, we put the open energy ontology, um, shipped it as part of our um, Marktstamm dann register. This is the energy, um, German energy core market data register. So um, a register about um, uh, yeah, energy units in, in Germany. And this allows us a very clear provenance uh, we can decide whether we want to have stable applications or whether we also want to have applications which um, at the yeah, install or runtime update to the newest version of an ontology. And when it comes to research, this allows us reproducible experiments. And um, using this technology, uh, this data bus technology stack, we have um, basically now for free a, a lot of um, app options to have a unified access to these ontologies. So two easy options I would like to briefly mention, but not going to show because of time reasons, is we can use this uh, virtual also quick start with Docker. And as collection, we then just provide uh, one uh, archival collection, which is for example, linked here, which contains at every time resolves to the latest snapshots of every ontology version, or we could use uh, data bus client, which also um, uses as parameter um, a collection or uh, a, a Sparkle query, and then uh, fetches you all the ontologies in the format of your choice. So you could um, use um, Sparkle, uh, you could use uh, Entribbles or Turtle, whatever is your choice. Yeah, this is the example which um, uses the quick start, which um, allows you to fetch all the data, all the ontologies, uh, the latest version of it to your local store so that you can perform uh, research tasks on it. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you, um, we could show you what what kind of road we are currently going when it comes to global and unified access at DBpedia. And I'm very happy to take questions. So looking at the chat, we don't have questions. Um, um, yeah, I think I can just uh, take the role of presenter and wrap up the tutorial.
Okay, so let's wrap up. Um, so what we have learned uh, during this tutorial. So starting with what Wikipedia is, uh, that it is a, actually a knowledge graph, but it is even beyond that. It's a whole technology. It's It consists of a platform, some processes, some services, as well as it is a wide multinational community of enthusiastic people. And also it's a, a network of people and organizations. Um, we also presented the, uh, the process of uh, generation of the Wikipedia knowledge graph, how it is generated and released, including the extraction framework, which is the tool that is used to extract and publish the data. Uh, then we had uh, also some uh, information on how the Wikipedia knowledge graph is organized and where you can find this knowledge. So it's basically all you need is to look at the database platform, which publishes the information that is behind the Wikipedia knowledge graph and organizes it into groups and data artifacts. We also give you information on how the uh, the Wikipedia infrastructure is organized, all the services around it, and uh, we also had uh, uh, some slides on uh, the global and unified access to uh, knowledge graphs, which was given by uh, Johannes. Some useful pointers. Uh, so, or if you want to learn more about the Wikipedia and the community just go at www.dbpedia.org. Feel free to join our Wikipedia uh, Slack workspace. So just follow the link dbpedia.slack.herokuapp.com and you can just yeah join the community there on Slack. We have also a forum. So forum.dbpedia.org. Should you have any questions or concerns or some ideas or announcements, feel free to post your uh, ideas, uh, questions at the forum. Uh, if you're interested in contributing to the development of the Wikipedia technology, you're welcome to visit dev.dbpedia.org, which is kind of a development Bible for Wikipedia. And also if you want to be up to date with the latest advancements around Wikipedia, you can subscribe to the Wikipedia newsletter on the link that you can find in this slide. So yeah, feel free to join Wikipedia, establish a Wikipedia chapter, become a member, or just get maybe uh, professional services from Wikipedia in terms of training, consulting, self-hosting, or technical support. Uh, feel free to write us at wikipedia.infi.org. So with this, if there are no questions, uh, in the chat, let's do a quick check. Uh, Jan uh, or Johannes, can you double check for questions, please? Yes, there are no questions. Okay. So then I would like to uh, thank everyone for joining uh, us. Uh, it was uh, great to have you all here and uh, hope to see you at some next occasion. So thank you and have a nice day. Bye-bye.